Good evening. This is VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South, broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kilohertz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and not simulcasting but also broadcasting via the Melbourne television repeater VK3RTV digital channel 1 and uh, which is also being uh, broadcasted uh, from the repeater to the BATC feed the British Amateur Television Club BATC feed on their video server uh, which you can find on their website look for the streamer and then look for active repeaters VK3RTV1 and uh, it's all operating I can see myself up there in full sound <coughs> the sound is there this week and we also have the YouTube stream running too so VK3CSJ and just look for the live symbol good evening everyone trust everybody is warm and trying to stay warm and watching the footy perhaps and uh, <laughs> And uh, I think I believe it's next Friday is an uh, is not an RDO, but it's a public holiday. I've just remembered that. Uh, oh, thank you. And so, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll still be here next Friday because it's not the not, not, not the grand final. Grand folds on the Saturday, so I don't expect anybody to be what, listening to me on a on a Saturday. Anyway, we'll be here next Friday, and it's a public holiday for us, so there it is. Um, all right, we've got a few things tonight, which we'll try and zip through as quickly as possible. I don't think Tamitha has put anything up at this stage. She's been quiet for the last two weeks. There's been no no new um, weather broadcasts. No, it's, uh, it's been two weeks now, so she's... Uh, I think she's gone on vacation, as the Americans would say. Anyway, there it is. We also have an email address if you wish to send a, a uh, email to uh, to the station here right now, vk3ekh at gmail.com, vk3ekh at gmail.com. Um, just making sure my mixing levels are right. I think the YouTube level should be okay. Um, I'm still suffering from a bit of a head cold. Uh, you might recall last week, you might recall, um, that uh, I was a bit um, on the edge there. I blamed it on sinuses and uh, change in the weather and seasons. But it appears it was just a head cold and I've actually been off work all week. Um, there's been lots of things happening around here <laughs> in respect to um, uh, the... Uh, uh, Pending uh, arrival of the three meter uh, scope dome, so uh, things are, uh, are really making a mess at the place at the moment. There's a, a trenches being dug and um, timber everywhere, and a deck being made, and concrete splashed around here, and electrical cable were about to go everywhere else. So <laughs> it's and of course not much happened today because it was just full on bad weather. And uh, we were out there for a little while today. Uh, the, the guys did come around to uh, try and get this trench uh, a bit more clear. And boy, oh boy, it was uh, it was just not good being outside. The chill factor and the rain just did not make it very good for doing anything outdoors. So it's a, a bit of a mud fest outside at the moment. But anyway, uh, very soon we'll have a uh, a dome in place. You know telescope in the dome and we'll be doing real time observations which will be fantastic my one of my lifelong dreams coming true as far as astronomy is concerned optical astronomy at least the astronomical society of victoria founded in 1922 has well over 1600 members throughout the states and australia and overseas Membership of the Society is open to anyone with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, uh, except in January, with the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm in the Mullio Hall, Burwood Avenue, in Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory. 
which is located not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. At the moment, uh, the monthly meetings is, are being televised on Zoom and YouTube channel. And I think the next um, the next monthly meeting will be actually held at the club room, uh, at the actual uh, hall. Uh, make sure you check on that. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at Melbourne Observatory, receipt of the ASV's magazine Crux, containing articles, news and observing notes and the like, and the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings with a permitting these instruments include the Society's 300mm uh, equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor, which is managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a recently, oh, I won't worry about the recently bit, uh, and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members too. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors, reflectors uh, available for short period loan uh, on the loan scheme, ASV's loan scheme, so members can try before they buy. Uh, members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use. Uh, with the larger two uh, requiring training, uh, which range from 300 to 1,000 millimeter in aperture. Also located on the site is an 8.5 fully steerable radio telescope, a Kennedy dish, uh, which measures which me members can access <laughs> with involvement in the radio astronomy section. And a very pleasant good evening to any of the RAS members that might be listening. Uh, coffee without sugar. I'm still getting used to that. Um, members are encouraged to make, encouraged that is, to make use of telescopes, or that is to make use, to make and use is the word, telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest active, catered for within the society. Uh, other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, meteor, comet, radio astronomy, computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research and astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook, but if you don't have the yearbook, which you won't have if you're not a member, uh, further information may be obtained by looking on the website, the ASV's website at www.asv.org.au and it all will be revealed. The ASV also produces, apart from a Crux a magazine, uh, a uh, what they call a Crux Extra Bulletins, which get emailed to members every other week to let people know what's coming up, to remind folks and uh, of any news that might be occurring. Please note that the ASV will conform to all government health directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed. And um, I don't usually mention this every broadcast, um, but uh, I know that uh, we're all into this little thing at the moment. The Astronomical Society of Victoria would like to say that in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community and we pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend the respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. That's a very thing to say. Everybody is saying it and uh, <clears throat> it's just one of those little things which uh, I won't throw in every broadcast but every now and then I will because it's just getting a little bit too much. All right. Um, Sky Notes. Cheers. 
<clears throat> planets. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, did I mention my email? I might just. Um, I'm currently watching the BATC feed, but I might just go to my email so I can see what's happening on my inbox. So I'll just do that. Ah, yes, the Wayne factor. All right. Um, okay, Wayne. And uh, he says, uh, curious signals and effects on the band tonight. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. I don't think it's Aurora related, though. Um, anyway, let's hope that the signal will be strong enough. Uh, so we're watching the inbox and we also have a discord channel watching going too I forgot to mention that um, uh, for those that have discord install discord and uh, come up and watch the uh, astronomical uh, chat window I think it's just called astronomy chat is how you find uh, the discord chat window anyway I can see that Martin is there VK7JAH uh, David is there, VK3KDM, uh, our resident MBO bloke. Uh, Bill is there, VK3KHT, and Kim is currently typing. <laughs> oh, <coughs> oh, I hope you didn't hear that. Um, so, good day to Kim, VK5FUSE, who's just about to make a statement, or was. So, that's how good the chat window is. It's quite live, a little thing. All right, getting back to uh, current planets, I'll just go straight to uh, planets in the sky notes. I know I mentioned it last week, but there were a few folks that weren't around. Uh, Mercury is not visible this month. Having passed in front of the sun, it is too close to our local star to be seen. Venus can be seen in September in the dawn sky about two hours before sunrise from 4.30 a.m. early in the month and a little earlier each morning. Now, remember that. Venus is a morning object at the moment uh, from about 4.30 a.m. onwards because you might get a chance to see a comet if you're up early enough and if the skies are clear. I'll mention more on that in a minute. Uh, Mars cannot be seen this month as it passes behind the sun from our point of view on Earth. After four months, it will reappear in mid-February in east, as in the east, as a, an early morning planet. Jupiter is visible this month after 11:30 p.m. in the northeast early in the month, and then a little earlier each night. It will move across the north before being lost in the early morning light by 6 a.m. Saturn is a beautiful planet. To observe this month rising in the east from 6:30 p.m. early in the month, and then a little earlier each evening, its subtle yellow tinge should make it obvious uh, all night as it moves across the north and then to the west before fading by 5 a.m. I think I'll just um, leave it at that. I just wanted to. Uh, Go through the planets only in this one. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH, with VK3 CSJ on the microphone. Uh, now, this is a thing about the comet. Um, a rare comet, we only just discovered it, will be visible this weekend. This is published 8th of September. Uh, now, the, a comet called Nishimura, I think that's how you would pronounce that, a comet called Nishimura, discovered just a month ago, could be visible to the naked eye this weekend, uh, offering stargazers a once in a 437 year chance to observe this celestial visitor. So here is your only lifetime chance to see this comet. Uh, I suspect that a pair of binoculars or a good telescope will be uh, the best way of being able to see it too. Damn, my observatory is just not ready for that one yet. Anyway, uh, the ball of rock and ice, whose exact size remains unknown, is named after the Japanese amateur astronomer Hideo Nishimura, uh, who first spotted it on August the 12th. It's a. It is a rare that it is rare that comets reach their moment of peak visibility so soon after being discovered," said Nicholas Beaver, an astrophysicist at the Paris Observatory. 
Most are discovered months, um, even years before the, they pass closest to, to the sun. Uh, the comet only swings by the sun every 437 years, he said, a long orbital period which sees it, in, uh, which sees it spend much of its time in the freezing outer solar system. In fact, I've got a, a picture of it here. I nearly forgot to show that. Uh, so there it is on the screen right now. And this is, that's actually, that is it. It is Comet Nishimura. It's not an artist's illustration or anything. Uh, when comets approach the sun from the vastness of space, the heat causes its icy core to turn into dust and gas which form a long tail. The sunlight reflects off this tail, allowing us to view comets from Earth. Nishimura, which has the scientific name C-2023P1, will pass closest to the sun on September 17. It will be 33 million kilometers from the sun, which is less than a quarter of the distance between the Earth and, and the sun, Beaver pointed out. The comet will then pass harmlessly by Earth at a distance of 125 million kilometers. For stargazers, the comet will be easiest to observe this Saturday and Sunday, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. But I figure, when, the, when it says this, uh, the best thing to do is to look at the sky before sunrise in the northeastern direction to the left of Venus in a clear sky free of pollution and obviously city lights. So they're saying that a little bit to the left of Venus is where this comet is going to be this weekend. So considering that Venus is a morning object at the moment, it's up there before sunrise, uh, if, if we've got a clear sky um, tomorrow morning, which hopefully we will have, although I'm not sure if I'll be up, um, but uh, look for our beautiful planet Venus, which will be a fairly bright object in the sky. And uh, somewhere to the left of it um, is this comet. But I suspect, again, you'll need uh, a decent uh, binoculars with a very steady hand, uh, or at least a telescope. Um, I don't think it's... Um, they say, well, hang on, they say here, people with small binoculars will easily be able to enjoy the spectacle, but if conditions allow, the comet may also be visible by the naked eye. So it is. it will be possible if, the, if you've got really good sky, uh, you might be able to see it by eye as a greenish... As, uh, the comet's tail is greenish uh, because it contains more gas than dust, Beaver said. So there it is, tomorrow and Sunday morning, hopefully the skies are clear, but if you're up early enough to, before sunrise, have a look towards Venus and see if you can make out a little greenish light in the sky, a little fuzzy ball of green, um, which will be uh, interesting. And that's what it looks like on the screen. Oh, I haven't got the repeater going at the moment, so I have to guess it's up there. Um, okay, so there it is. Uh, back to the camera. And uh, time is 18 past the hour. And next article is about an X-ray telescope, courtesy of astronomy.com. Uh, XRISM, XRISM X-ray telescope launches this week to study the chaotic universe. Yet another instrument goes into orbit to study the universe. It never ends. The new observatory will open a new door on the high-energy cosmos as it investigates black holes, galaxy clusters, and more. And we have uh, a, an artist's illustration of this uh, new probe. If I can find it. <laughs> you know, I thought I did it all. I thought I placed all the images I needed it to place, and yet I still miss out on this one thing. Thing. Um, I don't know. Is this, I'm just not well, I guess. I do have it though. So stand by. I'll just bring up the image on the screen. Should be just there. Where is it? Where did I put it? I just brought it in. Oh, there it is. 
wouldn't it bother you? Okay, so there's the artist's impression of XI, XRISM, X-ray telescope. Um, the uh, XRISM will now launch Wednesday, September 6. Oh, it looks like it's already gone. Um, the August the August 28 launch was scrubbed due to in climate weather, in climate weather. All dates and times in the article have been updated to reflect a new launch date and time. Okay, so I have to assume it's already gone up. Because uh, this was published the 5th of September. So yeah, okay, it's just not too long ago. Uh, a new X-ray observing mission will change how we see and understand the ultra-hot universe. The X-ray imaging and spectroscopy mission, uh, which is XRISM, uh, led by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, will now launch this week on the morning of September 7. And yes, 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 yes. Um, after liftoff, XRISM will move into a low Earth orbit at a height of 550 kilometres at an inclination of 31 degrees. The universe is filled with hot gas that emits energetic light, X-rays, invisible to the naked eye and earthbound telescopes. Because energetic and extreme processes produce a high such light, X-rays hold critical information about the formation and evolution of the universe. XRISM, pronounced CRISM, will help experts understand how clusters of galaxies formed and evolved, how the universe produced and distributed the chemical elements, and what the structure of space-time looks like under gravity's intense pull, and how massive black holes affect star formation in their host galaxies. And there's just another image here of the, a bit more detail of this probe. And I did have this. Do I have this? No, I didn't put, bring that across either. Oh, mumba. Um, okay, hang on a sec. Give me a minute, because I do have it there. Uh, browse. Oh, sorry about the sniffling. I do apologise for that. Um, hmm, where are you? I did, did, did bring you across. It's not even... Oh, there it is. Oh, my goodness me. I'm not concentrating on what I'm doing, I can see that. Alright, I do have this other diagram. There it is on the screens right now and YouTube. Uh, okay, so it's a diagram showing you in a nutshell <laughs> uh, what, uh, what this uh, probe is doing. Um, giving you launch information uh, that, that it's uh, a, it's a two science t two science instruments resolve called uh, resolve measuring the temperature and dynamics of X-ray emitting objects and something called extend extend X T E N D imaging extended X-ray emitting celestial sources and their surroundings. Uh, so uh, yeah, anyway, there it is on the screen right now. You can look at that. Uh, XRISM or CRISM uh, transforms space uh, on into an obser observational laboratory uh, with its two identical mirrors called X-ray mirror assemblies XMA. Uh, unlike uh, classic telescopes, mirrors which are polished glass or metal, X-rays utilize a cylindrical construction of thin aluminium foils nestled one inside the other. In total, there is 1,624 segments that make up each XMA. The unique mirrors assembled at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, reflected or reflect those X-rays into a sensor uh, on the spacecraft 18 feet. 5.6 meters away. One of X, uh, one of CRISM's two instruments is a spectrometer called Resolve, a collaboration between JAXA and, and NASA. The instrument is kept 50 times colder than deep space in order to measure tiny changes in temperature imparted to its small 6x6 pixel detector by incoming X-ray photons. Temperature 
information can be converted into light intensity over varying ang- ranges of energies between 400 to 12,000 electron volts. Resolve measures light hundreds to thousands of times more energetic than visible light, which has energies of just a few electron volts. The instrument is kept this cold via a mechanical cooling process that takes place inside a container the size of a fridge, which is filled with liquid helium. The helium is expected to last for three years. Current instruments can only observe X-ray spectra in a comparatively blurry way, said Brian Williams, NASA's CRISMS project scientist at Goddard Space Flight Center. In a statement, he said, Resolve will effectively give X-ray astrophysics a spectrometer with a magnifying glass. The James Webb Space Telescope, in comparison, gathers similar data, but it's in infrared light. To aid Resolve, another instrument developed by JAXA, dubbed EXTEND, will give CRISM the ability to image X-ray sources with a bigger field of view than any other X-ray imaging satellite to date. EXTEND can observe over an area some 60% larger than the average size of the full moon. The instrument will both monitor nearby stars that give off variable X-rays and also maybe and, and also map uh, the properties of X-ray sources in the background. Uh, will resolve is work as resolve is working. So yeah, that's a new probe. It's in orbit around the Earth as we speak, giving us a more detailed view in the X-ray light. So uh, being, it will be interesting to see what uh, results start to uh, to come from that. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with a regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Nary Warren South. Um, g'day Kim and Remus. Yes, we know it's not so clear, skies. It's been like that for the last two days. It's horrible, isn't it? Who'd be an astronomer? Honestly, I'm spending so much money. You wouldn't believe the copious amounts of funding going into my interest in astronomy and that I've got to put up with cloudy skies. <sighs> Radio astronomy beats all that, but it's another story. Um, all right, uh, that was an ad break. Uh Next interesting article, courtesy of Kate Green. G'day, Kate, if you're listening. She's a very, very active lady on our space exploration section. And she's on the Facebook page. Every day she must average about 10 articles that she publishes uh, on the Facebook uh, space exploration page. She is absolutely amazing what articles she finds and posts. So good on you, Kate. Uh, uh, I think you're doing wonders with that. Anyway, this is one of the articles that she's published uh, on the 4th of September, I noticed. This one just now. Um, If Earth were an exoplanet, James Webb Space Telescope would know there's an intelligent civilization here. I should say it would. Uh, I'm not well, guys. Here, I'll have to put up with me. I'm still recovering, I think. If uh, If Earth were an exoplanet, JWST would know... There's an intelligent civilization here. Would know. Oh, something wrong about that sentence. Anyway, um, if we're going to look for life on other worlds, why not start with the one planet we know has life? Earth's atmosphere is rich with oxygen and molecules such as methane, which strongly suggest the presence of life. It also has traces of molecules such as nitrogen dioxide and CFCs, commonly known as Freon, which are strong indicators of an industrial civilization. Uh, As a recent study shows, if Earth were an exoplanet, the James Webb Space Telescope would identify these molecules in our atmosphere. The study is published on the ARXIV preprint server. The study starts with real observations of Earth's atmosphere. And before I continue on, there is a graph or a chart here which shows you what Earth looks like from space, essentially. And 
it's not a very clear graph. I, I, it's just it's just unfortunate. It's the way it was put to the internet. It's not a, a high res pup, but you get the drift if you're seeing the the, the on screen image. Um, this is a, a signature of Earth uh, or Earth's transmission spectrum. So if you had a a, a very sensitive spectrometer that looked at a wide range of uh, of uh, things. And pointed it towards Earth. This is this is the chemical makeup of Earth uh, on the screen as we speak. Getting back to the article, um, where was I? The the study starts with real observations of Earth's atmosphere. The Canadian satellite SCISAT Sky SkiSat, I suppose, uh, took high resolution spectra of sunlight passing through a cloudless region of Earth's atmosphere and from this identified a range of natural and synthetic molecules. Using an averaging and an averaging of the data across different atmospheric depths, an early study simulated the possible spectra as it would appear when Earth transits the Sun, seen from the outer solar system. This provides a good baseline for what exoplanet data would be obtained, or could be obtained. The authors then took this to the next level by roughing up the data, adding simulated noise to the signal, and then sampling it at a lower resolutions. This is similar to the kind of observations JWST would make on an exoplanet light years away. The goal was to determine if enough data could still be captured to identify atmospheric models, even when the observations are faint and noisy. Sure enough, the signal-to-noise ratio was strong enough to identify many of the molecules for an Earth-like exoplanet within 50 light-years of Earth. The team then took the idea a step further and considered the exoplanet system known as TRAPPIST-1. It's a system 40 light years away with seven known planets, two or three of which are potentially habitable. By introducing molecular spectra into the simulated spectra of Trappist, the TRAPPIST worlds, the team showed that JWST could identify both biological signatures and technological signatures should exist on a on a Trappist exoplanet. We still wouldn't be able to we still wouldn't be able to identify alien structures on this world, but we don't need to go that far to prove the existence of aliens. If JWST can identify oxygen and organic molecules and synthetic molecules such as CFCs in the atmospheres of nearby exoplanet, then we know an intelligent civilization either is or was present there. That would be a tremendous step forward in our understanding of life in the universe. Isn't that interesting? I, I think that uh, would be a fascinating study uh, to be involved with, uh, with such, uh, such uh, studies. This is VK3 EKH. Time is 10.33. Continuing on with the JWST's um, theme. Uh, galaxies in James Webb Space Telescope's mirror are closer than they appear. New research, this is published August 31. Uh, what is it? Astronomy.com. <clears throat> uh, new research shows we might be overestimating the distance to faraway galaxies in the early universe. Recent announcements from the James Webb Space Telescope team have shown galaxies in the very early universe are far more advanced, mature and evolved than they ought to be. But that might be because we've been systematically overestimating the distance of those galaxies as new research demonstrates. And there's a little picture here that James Webb Telescope has taken. And, uh, <clears throat> oh dear. 
just not uh, not used to talking so much. <laughs> oh, my my vocal uh, whatever is not too good. Measuring distance in space is a tricky business. It's not always easy to discern whether a bright or large galaxy is relatively close, or whether it's physically large and bright. Over the decades, astronomers have developed a plethora of techniques to get around this issue. The majority of those techniques provide reliable results, most precisely in the relatively local universe. For very distant galaxies, like the ones JWST targets, we are forced to use much less precise methods. <laughs> and the picture you're looking at there at the, at the moment, uh, more galaxies closer to the moment of the Big Bang will be visible to James Webb Space Telescope. The infrared observatory will see farther away and thus further back in time than the Space Hubble Telescope. So this is just a generic picture that they've just stuck to the article, but it is a genuine picture, of course. Instead of directly measuring distances of extremely distant galaxies, astronomers tried, tried to determine their redshifts. A redshift represents the change in a, in a, in a, a galaxy's light spectrum due, due to its movement away from us because of the expansion of the universe. While it's possible to convert a redshift into a distance, astronomers need to assume a cosmological model to do it. In other words, assume a certain amount of dark energy, dark matter, or other param parameters that affect the expansion rate of the universe, so astronomers usually just report the redshift and move on. In general, the greater the redshift, the more distance galaxy is from us, which is what we, what we really care about anyway. JWST has been able to discover galaxies with redshifts of 9 to 14, representing some of the most distant galaxies ever found, floating very far away in the infant cosmos. No matter how you count it, these galaxies are among the first ever to appear in the cosmos scene. So it's puzzling that some of the structures appear to be surprisingly mature for their young ages. Some of the extremely distant galaxies are large, contain lots of stars, and have lots of heavy elements that require multiple generations of stars to produce. But those surprising results were based on one particular method of measuring the redshift, a method that isn't all that accurate. The method, known as photometric redshift measurement, takes the light from the galaxy and sorts it into bins. Astronomers then compare that light in those bins to the same light from nearby galaxies to get a rough estimate of a redshift. While rather uncertain, this method has the advantage of being quick and easy to do, so astronomers can easily gather a large sample of redshift measurements without having to do a whole lot of extra work. In a follow-up paper submitted for publication and appearing in the preprint pre of ARXIV, a pair of astronomers compared two dozen photometric redshifts with the redshifts obtained by a more accurate method. method. Spectroscopy, uh, spectroscopic redshifts evolve gathering or involve gathering a galaxy's detailed spectrum first and then using its measurement redshift to measure its redshift. While longer and more complicated, the process yields incredibly accurate redshift measurements. The researchers found that in their simple, almost all in, the, in their sample, almost all photometric redshifts were based biased to be high, higher than the spectroscopic ones. In other words, the rough estimate produced a redshift that was almost always higher than the true redshift. For some galaxies, the difference was small, but for others, it was huge. In one case, the photometric estimate of the redshift yielded 11.5, while the true redshift was less than 9. This is a difference of billions of light years. Overall, the researchers found that the photometric redshifts had to be toned down by roughly one standard deviation. This means that when the photometric redshifts were reported long uh, with their uncertainties, the true redshift lies near the low end of that uncertainty range, not the middle, as would be ex as would would expect with a bunch of random uncertainties. This is not a known phenomenon, researchers pointed out. 
In fact, it's something that the great astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington first pointed out in 1913 in the con context of surveys of distant stars. We expect photometric measurements to be imprecise, but in a random way, roughly half the galaxies should show a redshift that's too large and the other half too low. But since JWST is probing the extremely, extremely early universe and the first generation of galaxies to appear on the cosmic scene, more galaxies exist closer to us than farther away. And this means more chances exist in which galaxies would be biased high rather than low and so our overall samples will tend to be biased. It's unclear at this stage how these more refined redshift measurements will change our understanding of the early universe and especially how it will impact our view of those young yet mature galaxies. But this result shows exactly how science is supposed to work. Over time, it always careful, always cross-checking and always refining. You're tuned to VK3EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3CSJ in Narry Warren South. <clears throat> Uh, what is India's Atidia L1 Suns mission? Atidia, A D I T Y A. Atidia, 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 I don't know, L1 Suns mission. Indian Space Research Organization Atidia 1 mission is now orbiting Earth, studying the Sun and attempting to solve pressing solar mysteries. And I got a picture of that too somewhere here it's just an artist's illustration as it always is in most cases um, a Tidio L1 is a solar observatory operated by the Indian Space Research Organization the solar observatory will monitor the Sun with seven specially designed and distinct scientific payloads five of which have been developed by the ISRO it will do so from a position at a gravitationally stable point in the Earth-Sun system called Lagrange Point 1, around 1 million miles or 1.5 million kilometres from Earth, where a spacecraft can remain stable in relation to both bodies. ISRO describes the mission as a satellite de dedicated to the comprehensive study of the Sun. The L1 suffix in the mission names the reference to its location. And of course, Atidia means the sun in Sanskrit. The Atidia L1 spacecraft will not come any closer to the sun than this. Studying our star from this distance, around 1% of the total space between the Earth and the sun for the duration of its mission, which is estimated to be around 5.2 years, Placement of L1 will allow the spacecraft a view of the Sun that is uninterrupted by eclipses or occultations, according to ISRO. Altidia 1 uh, will investigate the Sun's atmosphere, the corona and its surface, the photosphere. The data, will collect, the data it collects could help solve lingering solar mysteries, such as how the corona is considerably hotter uh, than the photosphere, despite being around 1,609 kilometers further away from the sun's main source of heat, the nuclear fusion that takes place in its core. The proximity to Earth will also allow the mission to study Earth's magnetic field, the magnetosphere, and how it reflects or reacts to charged particles that stream towards the Earth from the sun in solar winds and in the coronal mass ejections. The Indian mission will also study the space environment around L1. That's enough I'll say of that. This is VK3 EKH, ASC Radio. Ah, dear me. Camera. Um, all right. Uh, just checking my other news sources here. G'day Martin, VK7JH, just joined the chat window. 
Time is quarter two. <clears throat> a newly discovered asteroid zooms within 2,500 miles of Earth. Published 18 hours ago, the space rock was too small to pose any danger. And I've got an artist's illustration of that too. There it is. A newly discovered space rock about six and a half feet wide, two meters, zipped past Earth today at a distance five times closer than GPS satellites orbit. The small asteroid designed designated C9FMVU2 sounds like a radio mode uh, was first spotted on Thursday morning, September 7. Way too late. Only a few hours before it made its closest approach to Earth. At 10.25 a.m. EDT, or 14.25 GMT, the space rock passed the planet at a distance of only 2,500 miles, or 4,000 kilometres, about 1% of the Earth-Moon distance. For comparison, satellites of the U.S. Navigational and Positioning Constellation GPS orbit at an altitude of 20,000 kilometres, 20,200 because the asteroid is so small, it never posed any danger to Earth. The European Space Agency said in a post Thursday on X, uh, X, what's X? Formerly known as Twitter, oh, I see. <laughs> <coughs> uh, had, the asteroid colli col uh, the, had the asteroid collided with the Earth, it would have burned up in the Earth's atmosphere, causing a spectacular fireball. A few small fragments would have been made to the planet's, may have made it to the planet's surface. According to Richard Mossel, ESA, ESA's head of planetary defense, the close pass will significantly alter the asteroid's trajectory due to Earth's gravitational pull. C9FMVU2 was too small to be visible to amateur astronomers, according to ESA. Astronomers have, have to date, um, uh, sorry, study him. Astronomers have to date discovered over 30,000 near-Earth asteroids, space rocks that zoom through space in close proximity to Earth orbit. Out of these, only about 2,300 are considered potentially hazardous. An, ast an asteroid must be wider than 440 metres and flow, uh, follow an orbit that takes it within 20 lunar distances of Earth to receive the official potentially hazardous label. Even much smaller asteroids, however, would cause widespread destruction if they were to hit the planet. For example, the shock wave caused by the impact of, of the only 65-foot-wide Shalabinsk asteroid, which exploded in the sky above southern Russia in 2013, shattered thousands of windows, injuring about 1,400 people and with shards of great flying glass. Astronomers are therefore working hard to map out the population of space rocks near our planet to make sure humankind isn't caught off guard by an unexpected collision. In case of potentially hazardous rock, we're on a collision course with Earth, the world's space agencies would attempt to divert the approaching asteroid with a mission similar to NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, spacecraft, which successfully altered the orbit of a small asteroid moonlet, Demimorphos, last year. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. where the time is 10.49 and Virgin Galactic will launch oh, hang on a minute, let me go change the picture I'm almost forgetting to do that each time um, Virgin Galactic will launch some of its first space tourist customers on Galactic 03 flight on Friday but who's flying? question mark you won't be able to watch it live online, the company has said. Virgin Galactic plans to launch its third commercial space flight on Friday, September 8, but you won't be able to watch the action live. The company is targeting Friday morning for a liftoff of a Galactic O3 mission, which will send three paying customers aloft from Spaceport America in New Mexico. 
Liftoff will occur around the same time as Virgin Galactic's previous missions, company officials told Space.com via an email around about 14.30 hours GMT. But Galactic 03 won't be live-streamed. It will have to rely on updates that Virgin Galactic provides the social media. In another departure from previous procedures, Virgin Galactic has not yet identified the three customers. Pretty much all will be known, uh, or pretty much all we know is that they've been ticket holders for a long time. Um, so that's all I'll put on that. I'll hang on, what's that sentence? The Galactic 03 crew brought their tickets, bought their tickets as early as 2005. Jeez, what a long time to wait. And then, and since then, have been an active part of the company's vibrant future astronaut com community. Uh, there added, the ticket price back then was considerably cheaper uh, than the current $450,000. $450,000 to get a ticket just to fly into low orbit. I don't know about that. Uh, all right, uh, this is VK3EKH. Time for a little bit of a, an advertisement for astrophys.com. Uh, where is my thing here? My banner? Where is my banner? Oh, there it is. Oh, jeez. All right. You may recall from time to time that I have played a podcast on this medium, courtesy of Brendan O'Brien, and his wonderful interview technique with all these wonderful great scientists. There are 177 interviews now, or podcasts that are available to listen to, of, uh, of professional scientists and astrophysicists and radio astronomers, even the odd amateur astronomer thrown in for good mix. Go to astrophys.com uh, to uh, have a, a look, check of his website, astrophys with a ph. <laughs> um, and uh, if you're in the local vicinity of the hills, you can go to the Mount Burnett Observatory and find out what they're doing Friday nights. Most most Friday nights, the MBO meet. And if it's a clear sky, they'll open the doors on the observatory up there uh, to... Uh, let members look at the sky but if you live up in the hills Mount Burnett Observatory is the place to uh, to get involved with uh, a former former Monash University uh, Observatory okay uh, we're rapidly coming up to the end I might be able to finish at 11 o'clock tonight this is pretty good going next I had here there we are uh, this is this article oh hang on let me go back to it uh, Strange Universe Space Colors, The Realm of Color is a Bizarre One, published September 6, 2023 on astronomy.com. Our universe is a secretive, secretive empire that burdens many astronomers with misconceptions. And nothing is as amazing, confusing and, the, and elusive as the colors of the cosmos. <clears throat> take everyone's favorite binary star albero i think that's how you pronounce that albiro alberio alberio um, whose components shine in a gorgeous fascinating yellow and blue and i've got this i've got this picture hang on a sec let me bring it up oh boy oh boy v mix i tell you um where are we? Uh, yeah. So, um, science explains that compared with this, with its golden counterpart, uh, the blue star is hotter because its greater mass creates awesome gravitational pressure and uh, boosted burn rate in its core. But a few astronomers know that those colors don't exist when no one's looking. That's because light is really just an energy morsel proposed of alternating magnetic and electric fields. Neither field has brightness nor color. Instead, when that invisible electromagnetic energy strikes an animal's cone-shaped retina cell, it in inaugurates a biological process 
where millions of neurons cooperatively fashion the sensing sensation of blue creating visual experiences con- consumes half the brain's capacity creating visual experiences consumes half the brain's capacity full stop so while alberio is some 400 light years away its colorful image occurs solely within the skull <laughs> What's more, usual, usually gorgeous alberio is colourless if it's not optically intensified by a lens or mirror. Our retina has about 100 million specialised rod-shaped cells that solely function in low-energy situations and deliver their sensations in grayscale alone. It's the less sensitive cones, numbering only 6 million, that register colour. That's why the Pallades look grey or white to the naked eye, but pastel blue through binoculars. When light is faint, the human mind won't create any sort of colour, which is why galaxies are always visually grey, no matter the telescope size. And even the grey is sometimes jeopardised. At bright levels, left eye's blind spot, where the optic nerve sits, never coincides with the right eyes so the image remains intact but at low light levels a different situation occurs our rod cell based spectro uh, um, cytopic vision suffers a huge blind spot twice the full moon's width lying straight ahead with the areas of both eyes with no rods are present matching up it's an important reason to observe faint celestial objects by looking slightly to the side. A 15 degree offset is ideal. And even that, a retinal, a retinal rod versus cone business, is a simplification. There are three different cone types named L, M and S. And only the S variety can show objects as blue. That's why 8% of all males missing one of the three types of cones since birth perceive the cosmos differently from the rest of us. They see rainbows as simplified bands of blue and yellow. These people with uh, deuteraneopia, or colour blindness, <laughs> ha- happily see Elboro as we do, though the contrasting hues of other binaries, like Antares, elude them. If you choose a single intriguing cosmic colour, it would be hard to beat green. It's the wavelength of peak energy emission of the sun, the topmost sensitivity of the human eye, the chief and often only visual colour of most aurora, thanks to oxygen emission at 557.7 nanometers, the main colour of planetary nebula. Yet amazingly, while you'll find stars are, that are red, orange, yellow, blue, brown, black, or even purple, purpley, there are no green ones. Why? Our sun emits electromagnetic energy that creates in our minds the sensation of every spectral color as rainbows vividly demonstrate. All the universe's living stars with active fusion cores emit those names those same colors and no others none fail to provide human visual systems into perceiving red green and blue lights primary colors which appear white when combined when combined that's why the universe's overall color is white or beige if a star is unusually hot it emits energy we perceive as blue excess Cool, star, cool stars like Betelgeuse create red surplus. But stars never emit solely green. And since nearly all stars still emit a lot of green, red and blue, white remains the main takeaway, with any extra blue or red constituting a placid of embellishment. This, this, this white... For, uh, this white flood explains why stars rarely appear richly hue, but only in pastels. 
the toughest celestial color is red, which is which can't be seen at all uh, when faint, not even as grey. That's why the reds in the in the Orion Nebula M42 so stunningly, uh, as in astro images, are rarely visible to the eye, even with backyard equipment. Considering M42's ruddy source, excited hydrogen, the most abundant element, it's ironic and unfair that this hue is withheld from our eager eyes. Uh, it's yet another quirk in a cosmic crowd with them. Cra crowded with them. Oh, that was only a short article, but it was just a bit tedious to get through. Um, I'm not quite with it. Oh, I'll bring me up back on the camera, live. Nope, oh, that'll do. Um, <clears throat> okay, if you want to read that article in your own way, with your own set of eyes, <laughs> um, it's you'll find it on astronomy.com under the news tab. Astronomy.com under the news tab and look for Strange Universe Space Colors. It was published September 6, 2023. Strange Universe Space Colors. <sighs> My goodness me. Okay, it is 11.01. Spaceweather.com <clears throat> Currently, the solar wind is at 345.6 kilometers a second at a density of 1.46 protons per cubic centimeter. The disk of the sun looks like this. <clears throat> it has currently uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I think it was. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Eight sunspots. There are, if you had a telescope and you could look at the sun safely right now, uh, you would see eight sunspots or regions anyway. Um, oh my god. And. And sunspot number is currently 135. The radio sun is currently 161 solar flux units measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters. Uh, the K, the planetary K index. God, have another drink. The K, KP index is 0.33, which is considered quiet. And the 24-hour max KP figure is 3, which is also considered quiet. Uh, there are no significant equatorial coronal holes on the Earth side of the Sun at the moment facing us. And uh, they, spaceweather.com is reporting that, um, that there is a possible Earth-directed explosion. Uh, NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory recorded a dramatic explosion near sunspot AR 3425 up there in the top uh, left hand corner uh, during the late hours of September 7. Debris from M2 category blast may be heading for Earth. NOAA analysts are currently unraveling uh, several overlapping CMEs to determine which one, if any, might be belong to this explosion. I'm sure Tamitha is working hard on her next report. Now there's also a picture of this comet in the morning sky here, courtesy of spaceweather.com. So there it is, that's what it's looking like in the sky. This is this would be uh, taken uh, somewhere in Alberta. Uh, so um, <clears throat> bright comet at... <coughs> Oh, pardon me. Bright comet at dawn. Set your alarm for dawn. There is a bright comet in the morning sky. Uh, Alan Dyer reports from Alberta. Here is a comet Nishimura. Captured at dawn, September 7, with the sky beginning to brighten with morning twilight colours. And you can just make out this comet. Uh, the comet was set amid the stars uh, in Leo, rising uh, in east just ahead of the sun. Uh, it reports a faint blue iron tail. I think the blue is just the, the Earth's atmosphere doing that. 
Um, currently shining like a fifth magnitude star, it is barely visible to the unaided eye, but an easy target for digital cameras. So there it is. It's what to look for, and I suspect, I believe, it uh, should be visible to, uh, in the morning here too, uh, apparently to the left of Venus. I could be wrong, but uh, they're saying to the left of Venus, so we're seeing Venus in the morning um, at the moment, so I don't know, it should correlate. Could be wrong though, somebody tell me if I'm wrong. Um, okay, so as of um, the 8th of September 2023, there were 2,349 potentially hazardous asteroids. So I think I'll leave that there. Um, and I'll finish off with just a, a little thing here. Um, me drinking water. Um, some of you might have seen this program. Uh, many 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 years ago it was called the astronomers uh, it was published or, or uh, presented by um, uh, who was it presented by a production of the KCET Los Angeles mob uh, back in 1991 as early as 1991 and uh, it was a uh, a TV documentary it went for five hours five hours and 42 minutes five hours and 42 minutes and uh it's two discs you can you can get that now well it's, this, this has been around for a while and i've actually had this this series because i was always impressed with it because they 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 dealt with radio astronomy of course it was what got my interest straight away um but there's two discs disc one disc two and disc one has three episodes. Disc two has three episodes. Uh, the first episode is called "Where Is the Rest of the Universe?" Nearly ninety percent of the universe mass is undiscovered. Prominent scientists aim to solve the mystery of the of the mission missing cosmos. Next article uh, 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 um, episode is searching for black holes. International scientists team up to find a supermassive black hole by creating a telescope half the size of earth third episode is a window to creation scientists try to unravel the mystery of how the universe began and developed into its present form on D dvd disc two you've got waves of the future two friends and fellow scientists examine the phenomenon known as gravity waves ripples in fabric of time and space the second episode on that one is Stardust. Astronomers investigate the mysteries that surround the remarkable life cycle of stars. And the last episode is titled Prospecting for Planets. Scientists scour the night sky for evidence of other planetary systems from a, a remote observatory at the foot of the Andes. It's in colour. 5 hours and 42 minutes. And this was released in 2002. By home video so just just if you're interested just type in the astronomers it's just called the astronomers um, uh, yeah very very fantastic you know it's one of these things that you, that you just want to have in your library I'm not sure if the ASV have got it the ASV might have this in their library but what I'm, uh, I'm alluding to here too <laughs> is that just recently I discovered that the the TV series actually has a companion book that was published and there it is this is the companion to the DVD or the PB, PBS television series called The Astronomers and that's it The Astronomers by Donald Goldsmith companion book to the PBS television series and it's a hard cop hardback copy there's a nice picture of some radio telescopes there on the back which you can see and it's that thick it's one inch one inch thick <laughs> and it's it's a beautiful publication it's uh, let me see how many pages it's got 
332 pages, 332 pages, and it's it is the it is the companion to the DVD series to the the series, and the article the 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 chapters are. Hang on, let me get this. Hang on, make sure I've got the right page. Oh, it's too many to read. It's too much to read out. I won't bother. Um, suffice to say, <coughs> I found it by pure mistake. I I was looking for something else, totally looking for something else, and I came across this book on eBay. There's a lot of them. There's a stack of them. It's not just this one book. There's that there. There's there's people selling them all over the place. <laughs> so if you want a copy of the uh, the hardback copy of the Astronomers. Uh, just search on eBay it's it's there and it was only I think it was uh, $15 US $15 US for that so I thought damn it I've got the DVD series why not get the companion book to it I, I think like that I was going to have you know, um, you know hand in hand with this stuff so uh, there it is The Astronomers a companion book to the PBS television series so um, that's available. I didn't know it was. All these years later, and there it was. And of course, the DVD series too. So there's my review to finish off tonight. And I'm uh, barely hanging in. Now, um, where is my notepad? I don't have my notepad. Oh, there it is. Way over there. Hang on a sec, gen- ladies and gentlemen. While I get out of the chair. Oh. Oh, mamma mia. I tell you, this this late Friday night business has got hair on it. Oh. All right, now we shall... Um, I'll have to turn up the volume on that. I probably need to put my headphones on uh, as normal. So, uh, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Uh, we shall now take a quick listen on 3541 kilohertz to see who may still be lingering around and um, uh, wanting to say hello. So this is VK3. Oh, I'm just getting my volume ready. VK3 EKH listing on 3541. <laughs> All right, I've got VK5KKT, VK7JAH, and VK3VIN. <clears throat> the next bunch of stations to call in, there must have been three stations that doubled. Uh, let's see if we can try again on those ones. VK3TJS, All right, we got you there, Jack. TJS. Who was the other station? All right, VK3 SPX, and uh, who else is there? Okay, all right, okay, VK5 KKT, VK7 J H J. Um, what is it? <laughs> oh, 7 J A H. That's it. I knew that was right. Um, VK3 VIN, VK3 TJS, and VK3 SPX, and VK5 FUSE. Was there anybody else? Okay, to the top of the list, VK5 KKT, take it away, VK3 EKH. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Oh, Struth. 
headphones are too loud. Um, VK5, KKT, VK3, EKH. Yeah, no worries, Ian. Good signal from you. You're about 10, 15 over 9. The lightning crashes are making it a little bit tricky, but um, uh, still, uh, we're hearing you uh, quite well. So thanks for calling in. Good to hear you. And uh, thanks for the uh, the kind words, too, on tonight's uh, uh, broadcast. Excellent stuff. Good on you, Ian. Thanks, mate. Um, across to uh, Martin, VK7, JAH, VK3, EKH. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, um, Martin, VK7JH, VK3EKH, returning, very good. Yeah, we're hearing you uh, through the lightning crashes, so um, yeah, it's uh, certainly a bit of lightning activity occurring uh, around the place, and uh, uh, unlike the last uh, few uh, Fridays, it's been relatively quiet of uh, lightning crashes, but uh, today it's it's just full on. We've had some pretty pretty bar, uh, nasty uh, cold front uh, came uh, over Victoria these last couple of uh, days and particularly the last 24 hours it's um it's brought the same cold wind that you'd be feeling right now I'm sure uh, it's uh, yeah, it's currently eight uh, eight point two degrees and uh, it didn't get uh, I don't think it got above 12 degrees today uh, the uh, that wind uh, chill factor and all that was uh, just nasty stuff really nasty stuff but this time next week uh, we should be looking up at the mid 20s uh, going going up to about 26 I think they, they're predicting uh, into the high 20s uh, this time next week so uh, boy oh boy what a difference that'll be why can't it be like that right now I've, I've got so much happening in the backyard here uh, I, I just I just don't want it with the, you know I, with all the digging you know, there's there's so much soil around it's all all getting wet and muddy Anyway, that's another story. Um, thanks, uh, Jack. Uh, not Jack. Um, Martin. <laughs> and uh, uh, thanks for listening in. Uh, Ian, VK3VIN, VK3EKH. Good evening, sir. Top 10. 
temperature today was 12. So, uh, as you said to Martin, the uh, big cold front hit. And wow, the wind was absolutely amazing. Uh, but mainly from the southwest. I think that's Antarctica is down that way, isn't it? So it has come past Martin and up here. Thanks a lot, Chad. Uh, another good broadcast and uh, much appreciated. VK3EKH, VK3VIN. Not a problem, Ian. VK3VIN, VK3EKH returning. Excellent stuff. Thank you for your kind words and report. And uh, duly noted. And uh, you're also about uh, 10 to 15 over 9 here tonight. Uh, comparative signal to, uh, to, uh, to Ian there at VK5KTT, two worlds. And, um, uh, but probably a little bit louder. Um, <laughs> but the lightning crashing is, is certainly taking its toll. Um, but yeah, I, I thought that article on the on the color. Uh, I just found that like I, I, all those articles I read out tonight, I, I found within the last forty five minutes going to air, and uh, I I saw that one on um, astronomy dot com. A strange universe, space colors, and I had a. I just read the first couple of paragraphs, and I thought, oh, that's that sounds interesting. So uh, it was only a relatively short article. It. Um, Maybe I should have left that to the to the beginning when I had more more energy uh, <laughs> to to read out. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's it's there on astronomy dot com, and uh, uh, yeah, we, we got very easy to uh, to uh, translate that into a uh, uh, an audio file to uh, have read out to read out without a problem. So, uh, but very interesting. Like oh, I'm I'm about to get into the world of color. <laughs> Um, in, in other words, I, look, I've I have looked, had, I have, you know, I've done my fair share of looking through, gal- uh, through telescopes, various telescopes of uh, various sizes and and uh, abilities, and uh, I th- I do note the fact that most of the distant galaxies that or nebula that we can see with good telescopes and good seeing conditions have a very distinctive color to it that I've I've noticed. I've I've only ever really seen shades. Shades of blue, or shades, or, or hues of of grey, you know, white shades of white, grey, blue, sort of colour, and I, I think a lot of people get the mis idea or interpretation that when they look at uh, pictures of uh, of uh, nebula or uh, galaxies that have all this colour associated with it, um, it's um, in reality it's not quite like that. Um, and uh, it's all in the processing. So there's a, there's a part of it that I'm still yet to learn about, um, but I'm b- about to set up a, my own telescope observatory in the back, and uh, I've, I've got a, a three telescopes to uh, experiment with, and the main aim is to get myself uh, uh, pretty good with the, the astrophotography side of things, and uh, I'm looking forward to developing my own color images uh, that's pleasing to my eye. Um, <laughs> whether they're the real colors of the galaxy or not is, is, is another thing. But that's that's the thing I want to study. That's the thing I would like to uh, get a little bit more of a handle on um, so that I can actually speak to, uh, to people about that with some sort of... Uh, uh, authority rather than saying oh I'm not really too sure so uh, it's uh, I'm now going into a, a different realm of astronomy for me I've I'm, I'm, I'm putting radio astronomy behind me for a little bit and uh, looking at uh, the optical side of it and a few other things associated with op- using optical telescopes so uh, uh, it's going to be a fun time I, it, but of course with optical astronomy you're restricted to having clear skies and uh, that's that's the biggest problem. All right, thanks, Ian. Uh, across to you there, Jack, up at Chipperton, VK3 TJS, VK3 EKH. Oh, VK3 EKH, this is VK3 TJS. Good evening to you, Clint, and uh, all that joining the broadcast and listening to it, and great to Ian from Bendigo. And all I can say is just uh, amazing broadcast tonight. Yeah, the signals are... I'll probably just confirm what Ian said, uh, you know, 20 to 30 over most of the time. And uh, I thought, uh, where's the noise from HF gone? There's no noise. <laughs> it was just you all the time with 30 over. And uh, interesting stuff. And, uh, you know, with your optical astronomy, that's, uh, that's, uh, that should be pretty, pretty cool, I think. 
and uh, we, we're lucky in that at most of the time I guess we have uh, kind of clear sky not much uh, not much happening other than you know this winter we have plenty of gray sky, gray sky around but yeah I'm sure you'll enjoy it uh, just a reminder to all uh, this uh, Sunday Shepherd and Hatchet at uh, 10 a.m. start in uh, Wall Street uh, and it should be a bumper day uh, the weather should be okay about 16 degrees, I think there was a forecast last time I looked, and uh, just a uh, few uh, clouds, but hopefully it's okay. So, uh, yeah, it was invited, and uh, say hello. Uh, thanks for the broadcast again, and have a good weekend. VK3KH, this is VK3TJS. No worries, Jack, VK3TJS, VK3EKH, thank you for the report. Uh, uh, th- the report, yes, and... Um, and also uh, reminding folks of the uh, uh, the Hamfest, I think it was. Um, so uh, all very good. I'm sure uh, folks will head up there to uh, to explore that for sure. I haven't uh, <clears throat> I haven't done much travelling uh, myself lately. Um, I think the the last big long trip I did was to Adelaide and back uh, in the car Subaru, which survived. So uh, um, I haven't really seen too much country driving uh, for a while. Maybe I'm a little bit out of touch in that too. Anyway, that's another story. But look, thanks, Jack. Uh, thank you for the report. Um, okay, uh, across to Stephen, VK3SBX, VK3EKH. Uh, VK3EKH, this is VK3SBX, uh, Stephen Hatchett, uh, Hello, Stephen. Uh, hi, Clint. Um, look, I must have uh, a bit of a confession, actually. I, I didn't listen to the broadcast at all today. Um, but uh, my uh, my son has just arrived and he's brought um, three friends with him. They all um, arrived uh, just as uh, you were just start, uh, just finishing up. So uh, I brought them up to the ham check here for them to uh, have a little look how the radio works. So uh, by all accounts, it was a good broadcast, uh, judging by what others said. Um, so uh, well done, but I'm afraid I'll, I didn't get to see it. I can, I can look at you on the YouTube, by the way. Uh, but of course, you're 20 seconds delayed. I can see you shaking your head there. But uh, anyway, look, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Clint. It was uh, good to come up and and say hello. You're uh, you're 30 dB over nine here, so really good signal. Lots of lightning crashes, but uh, but coming through really well. So anyway, just send a cheerio to uh, all the people in the radio shack here, and I'll uh, I'll uh, let someone else have a go. VK3 uh, EKH VK3 SPX. Not a problem, <clears throat> VK3 SPX, VK3 EKH returning. A very pleasant good evening to everybody that's in the uh, in Steve's studio, <laughs> in his radio shack there. Um, I was had a pen ready to, to write down names, but uh, you didn't mention anybody's names. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, there it is. Um, this is what ham radio is all about and uh, getting up on the noisy bands and listening to lightning crashes and having to deal with all that sort of thing but it's good fun it's interesting stuff <laughs> um, but then we've also got the ATV medium I'm, I'm broadcasting a TV picture over the Melbourne television repeater a high definition transmission um, and I'm just providing a uh, YouTube stream just for the sake of those that uh, don't have access to the TV repeater, so it's the only reason for that. Um, but I'm showing a slightly different angle on the on the shack here. Uh, meanwhile, it, I can go back to the other one here, and that's the uh, the shack behind me. So um, yeah, uh, there it is. Um, very very. Uh, I hope you guys are finding it of some value, some interest. You can think about getting your ham license. Uh, it's a pretty easy process these days. <laughs> <coughs> oh, I've still got something wrong with my lungs. I can hear it uh, through the through the headphones. It's it's not good. Um, thanks, Steve. Good to hear you, mate. And uh, you're you'll be you've you're forgiven for not uh, not listening in today. So it's all right. You're off the hook, but don't do it again. Okay. Um, all right. Now, the last station on the list I have is Kim VK five FUSE. A little bit weak there, Kim, but we'll give it a go. VK five FUSE VK three EKH.
or I think you put it back to me, VK5, FUSC, VK3, EKH. Sorry to say, uh, Kim, I could just barely hear you. Um, I, in fact, the only thing I think I heard you say was that I was 5 and 9. I don't know if there was any plus figure on that, but I'm pretty sure I heard you say 5 and 9, that I was 5 and 9 something. So that's something. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Kim, giving it a go. Uh, I, I know I can see you on the on the the uh, Discord, not a problem. Um, and uh, no, I think you're also watching the uh, the YouTube side of things too. So uh, not a problem. You can hear you, you can hear yourself on playback yeah, when when I stop recording, uh, stop uh, streaming. You can uh, rewatch uh, the uh, YouTube. And you can listen to yourself because I've got I've got a direct feed uh, of eighty going over over the YouTube channel, so you can hear just how strong you were. <laughs> <coughs> oh dear. Anyway, Kim, not a problem. We got your report, but you, you're uh, a pretty pretty poor signal here in into uh, Melbourne tonight. But it's partly because of all the lightning crashes too. I blame it squarely on the lightning crashes. Is there any other station VK3 EKH listening? All right. <clears throat> Thanks, gentlemen. Um, Ian Martin and Ian, Jack and Stephen Kim for calling in tonight. Uh, I, I appreciate that. And uh, to all the stations that are come up on the, uh, the folks that come up on Discord. Uh, uh, again, Kim, Rumors. Cheers to their Rumors. Martin and uh, Dave, KDM, VK3, KDM and uh, uh, Bill, VK3, KHT. And that's about all I saw there. Uh, I know Richard was around somewhere in the background, VK3 VRS, um, and uh, and of course the VCL factor. So <laughs> thanks for the emails there, and um, uh, all excellent stuff. I think everything went pretty well tonight, considering that I'm still not quite out of the uh, the woods from this uh, head cold that I think I yeah I had. It wasn't COVID. I did all those tests and nothing came up there. So I thank goodness I, I haven't caught COVID. I've Never had the flu. I've, if, I've only had the common cold uh, in, in all my life. That's the only thing I've ever dealt with. But this is resting in my lungs. It's uh, it's uh, it's not making me cough. I mean, if I laugh, that's when when I notice it. But uh, yeah, normal, it's it's okay. But it's all in the nose at the moment. Well, it's all nasally, and it's it'll take another two or three days, I think, before I can get up, get past it. Cross fingers. You know, I'll leave, leave you all with it right now. I don't know what football team won tonight. Uh, I suspect it was um, the other team. So, uh, anyway, see you all next Friday. Take care and um, uh, look after yourself and uh, stay warm. Um, and I shall update everybody on the situation with my uh, my uh, um, my uh, timber deck for the uh, the dome and once of course once the dome arrives and gets assembled i'll have pictures and i'll show everybody what uh, what that's all about this is vk3 ekh thank you for listening we'll see you all next week take care this is vk3 ekakila hotel on behalf of the astronomical society of victoria where you can find more information at www.asv.org.au and uh, we'll see you all next week Bye for now.